Okay, kiddos, it's me again. Today we're going to look at the 1917 revolutions and beyond. Now, as we know, Russia had a terrible experience in the Great War. They're losing men, they're losing battles, they don't have enough rifles, they don't have enough food, they have terrible leadership, they have no organization, their pets' heads are falling off. So all these things are taking place, and Russia is starting to basically crack. It's sort of almost like imploding. Now, the event that really sets it off looks a lot like one that has already happened. See if this sounds familiar. People in St. Petersburg are hungry, they are cold, they're looking for help, and they protest asking the Tsar for help, just like what happened at Bloody Sunday. Now, the last time this happened, remember, the Tsar ordered his army to fire into the crowd. He tries to do this again, but guess what? His army joins the crowd, and the revolution is on, y'all. So, there are actually two revolutions in Russia in 1917. That sounds like a joke, doesn't it? How bad was life in Russia in 1917? So bad they had two revolutions. The first one's the February Revolution. It will be followed by the October Revolution. The first revolution, the February one, accomplished this. The government, led by the Tsar, was overthrown and the Tsar was no longer in charge. The rebels will replace this government with a new government called a dual government because it featured two parts. One half of it is more of a national government called the provisional government. And the other half is more local and it's called the Soviets. Now the provisional government, as I said, is national and it's led by members who used to be in the Duma, the legislature. The leader is Alexander Kerensky who is really famous, really for making a terrible decision, and that is he kept Russia fighting in the war, which was really unpopular. Now, members of the provisional government, like Kerensky, do want changes, okay? They're not conservative, they're liberal. However, they don't want to make total changes. They don't want to give everyone the same amount of land or give everyone the same amount of political power. So they're afraid if they do these things, their status will decrease. Now, the more local version of this government were the Soviets, and these are based on cities or villages, and these are councils of workers and soldiers. These groups wanted the opposite of the provisional government. They wanted total change. Since they represent those who have no representation, workers and soldiers, they're looking to give a lot of benefits to these people. The Bolsheviks were a communist group like we talked about last time. And as you can see here, they are very powerful and they are very important in leading these local Soviets. If you look right here and right here, you have the leaders Karl Marx and Leon Trotsky. You'll learn more about them in just a minute. Now, as we said, the Soviets want total change. They want total reform. This means land reform and political power for all social classes. Do you think this dual government will work with the provisional government wanting limited changes and the local Soviets wanting total changes? Exactly. Now the leader who I just showed you of the Bolsheviks, Vladimir Lenin, is so radical that he has been exiled from Russia many times. He's kicked out for his rebel views. And while he's away, even though he's away during the February Revolution, he publishes his goals for the future of Russia, and these are called the April, April Theses. Now, in the April Theses, he's promising the following goals. The first, not to support the provisional government. There's your answer right there. Second, he promises to end the Great War. Do you think that's popular? You bet it is. Third, he wants to take this show on the road. He wants to export a revolution for the workers, not only in Russia, but he wants to take it to other countries as well. And lastly, he wants the, the poor workers and peasants and soldiers, if you want to add soldiers to the list, he wants to promise them better land opportunities. It's easiest to remember the Bolshevik slogan, peace, land, and bread. 
And as they showed you on the crash course video, all three things are very popular in Russia right now. Now, the months between February and October were very chaotic. Russia keeps losing the war, and these two parts of the government, the provisional government and the Soviets, continue to fight politically. And so, at the end of this period, the Bolsheviks will lead a revolution to become the powerful new government of Russia. And as Lenin is exiled for most of this time, it is Leon Trotsky, who is the leader of the army of the Bolsheviks, to, um, to lead this revolution. Here's old Leon Trotsky. It's almost like he's saying, what? Say it louder. What? What? Now, one of the best stories of this whole World War I era is that Lenin was exiled um, and he wanted to get back to Russia. Well, Germany also wanted to get Lenin back to Russia. Why do you think Germany would help Lenin return to Russia? Question mark, question mark, question mark. Before I answer that, they did put Lenin in a train car and sent him into Russia and they gave him money. So again, why do you think they would do that? So when this October Revolution is successful and Lenin achieves power, the first thing he does is he ends Russia's participation in the war by signing with Germany the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk. That German plan to get Lenin back to Russia looks pretty smart now, doesn't it? What does this mean? It means that members of the old government better move fast. Um, if you were a czarist government official, if you were the royal family, this is not going to end up well for you. Because all these people were sent to Siberia for exile and hard labor, but most of them were simply executed, including the entire royal family. But this may seem like a new beginning for Russia, but sadly, this is a time of further war. Now, instead of fighting the Great War, Russia will fight itself in a civil war. And we'll look at this as the Reds versus the Whites. The Reds are the Bolsheviks, Lenin, Trotsky, people who want radical communism through violence. And the Whites are simply everybody else, Mensheviks who want more gradual communism, uh, other communist parties, non-communist parties, royalists, Western countries. The Americans and the English actually send soldiers to fight against the Reds because they were so afraid of communism. Even though they are outnumbered, after three years, the Red Army wins, primarily because they have better unity. The only thing that unified the White Army was that they all hated the Reds. And as we've seen before, a single common enemy as the only point of unification typically does not work in the end. Now with this, everything will change. The Bolsheviks will change their name to the Communist Party, and Russia will become the largest republic in the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, better known as the USSR or the Soviet Union. Okay, enough anthems. You can see right here just how big the USSR was. I said was because they don't exist anymore today in 2014. Um, the red right here, this is Russia, and then you can look at the countries around Russia, which include Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Ukraine, Belarus, Georgia, Armenia, Azerbaijan, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, and later to an extent, Mongolia will all be part or allied to the USSR. This will be the symbol that the USSR will use. This is on their flag. It's a hammer and a sickle. The hammer is what urban workers use in factories. A sickle is what farmers use to cut down crops like wheat. So, as you can imagine, Russia's been through the ringer, as they say. The Great War was terrible for Russia. The Russian Civil War killed millions. And then they have a food shortage because of all the land that was destroyed in the Civil War um, killed even more millions. So Russia's really had a hard time. It's for this reason that Lenin decides to implement communism slowly in Russia. 
And he does this with his new economic policy called the new economic policy. Think of this as limited capitalism. Now, the companies that are big, 20 employees or more, or farms that have 20 farmers or more working on the same farm, will be bought and owned by the government. The government will run these farms. The government gets the profits from these farms. Um, that's very communist. But if you owned a small company or a small farm, less than 20 employees, you only paid a tax. And then you got to keep whatever money you made by selling your product. And the idea here is that Russia needs to um, recuperate themselves. They need to build their economy back up because they're not ready for such a radical economic change yet. Now, Lenin dies just two years after the Russian Civil War, so he doesn't really see a lot of the changes that would happen later. He'll be around, as you'll see later, but he won't see the changes. Now, there's a pretty big power struggle between people who will replace him, and all the candidates come from a thing called the Politburo, which is sort of like a board of directors or an executive council of Russia. The two main candidates were... Leon Trotsky, who we've already met, what? Who is the army general, and a, he was a former journalist. And less um, visible, but just as powerful, is a guy called Joseph Stalin, who is more of a behind-the-scenes sort of power broker, and he was the general secretary of the Communist Party. All right, here's Joseph Stalin right here. Want to know some fun facts about him? Okay. Number one, he's from Georgia. He's not even from Russia. Not Georgia where I'm from, silly. But the country of Georgia. Number two, he was shorter than Napoleon. Didn't think you'd see someone shorter than Napoleon, right? Wrong, because Napoleon wasn't short like we've talked about. Um, number three, he's super paranoid. If you are popular, it's not a good idea to be around Joseph Stalin. In the end, Stalin won this political fight to become the next uh, leader of Russia. And for this reason, the title of the leader of Russia, or the Soviet Union, will be General Secretary, because that's the title that he had. One last thing. What do you think happened to Leon Trotsky? Um, well, Trotsky knew what was good for him, and he left the Soviet Union because he didn't trust Stalin. Um, Trotsky went to Mexico, where he became really good friends with uh, Frida Kahlo and Diego Rivera, but he was then murdered by Russian secret police in Mexico City in 1940. So as you can see, Stalin doesn't trust anybody, and even though he defeated Trotsky, he wanted him dead. Now, let's look at how Stalin used propaganda to become popular. The first thing he did was after Lenin died, Stalin deified him, meaning he made him like a god. He named everything after Lenin. He built statues of Lenin. He even renamed St. Petersburg, which was called Petrograd at the time, Leningrad. Okay? And then, as I said earlier, Lenin would always be around. Even if he couldn't see the changes, he would still be there. This is what I mean. If you go to the Red Square today in Moscow, you have the Kremlin, the government building of the Russian government. Well, if you go inside, you will find this person. Ladies and gentlemen, you are looking at Vladimir Lenin. This is not a dummy. This is not fake. This is Lenin's actual body. Stalin had him preserved and placed in a glass case so people could go and pay respects and basically honor him. He is still there today. This is another picture taken from a different angle, of course, but you can really see um, just how absolutely creepy this is. So why do you think Stalin would do this to Lenin? He can't even kiss up to his boss anymore because Lenin's dead. But if people think, wait a minute, we loved Lenin, Stalin loved Lenin, then Lenin and Stalin must have been close. Maybe Lenin wanted Stalin to follow him and be the next Russian leader. All Lenin everything. Lenin statues go up everywhere. His banners go up everywhere. As I said, they name a city after him, changing St. Petersburg to Leningrad. Now, I don't read the Cyrillic alphabet. I cannot speak or read Russian, but 
this sort of reminds me of Vladimir Lenin, sort of like Obi-Wan Kenobi, who is sort of like a, a ghost-type inspirational figure who is leading Stalin, okay? This is so propaganda in that Stalin is doing everything with Lenin's support and guidance over his shoulder. Do you guys like Photoshop? Well, it didn't exist during the 1920s, but a more ancient version of it did because this photograph never happened. Look carefully for details that this was a doctored photograph. And then maybe my favorite painting of the three, it looks like Stalin is the, the student, the pupil, and he's writing down all these words of wisdom from Lenin. Now, the tragedy in all this is that Lenin distrusted Stalin. and He actually wrote in his journals that we found much after both of these men's deaths, he wrote, don't give power to Joseph Stalin. I don't trust him. How creepy is that? Because that's just what happened. Now, Stalin's Russia. As I just said, Stalin is much more of a dictator than Lenin. Lenin could have become a dictator, but he died of natural causes so soon after the Civil War that he just he didn't have that opportunity yet. Maybe he would have been, but by that point, he was not. What Stalin was much more than Lenin was paranoid. Okay, Anyone who was popular, anyone who was talented, he had arrested. Popular athlete, arrested. Popular scientist, arrested. Popular teacher, arrested. He also cancels Lenin's new economic policy and replaces it with a series of five-year plans. Um, this is total communism because he's basically forcing people to make things like steel, which happens to be the word Stalin in Russia, in order to catch up with the rest of Europe. Further, he collectivizes all the farms. So he takes farms from the control of private people and he gives them into um, the power of the state. So let's say that you are arrested. Where do you go? Well, they send you to Siberia, which is really cold in the middle of nowhere, and they send you to a place called the Gulag. And this is a place where you could work for a long period of time. Mostly people worked in things like gold mines in order to benefit Russia. Now these are usually seen as death traps because the work is so hard, they have so little food and water, and the, the temperatures are really, really cold. And as I said, some people in the Gulag are actual criminals. Others are people that Stalin feared would become more powerful and popular than he would, like history teachers. So your assignment. How was Stalin a totalitarian dictator? Last night you read in your textbook about this, and I want you to go back and look at the categories and tell me how does Stalin fit as a dictator. Second question, were people in Russia happy? Yes or no? Why or why not? Good day sirs and madams.